you for inviting us to speak today. Um, I do want to share a little bit about Premier Research and um, who we are as a company and what we do. So Premier Research is a clinical research organization and we help the most innovative companies bring um, life-changing ideas into medicines, medical devices, and diagnostics. We're a global company. We have over 2,000 employees. We manage projects across 75 countries. We have six offices in the United States and 18 offices around Europe and Asia PAC. This whole uh, summit is an amazing summit and I just listened to uh, Mifan talk and I actually took some notes because he really touched on some things around um, you know, digital transformation in the healthcare, and that really resonates also with clinical research. So because this is about innovation and oftentimes necessity drives innovation, I wanted to share a little bit with you about what happened in 2020 and what COVID taught us about clinical trials and clinical research. So what we learned is that traditional clinical trial designs were not gonna be uh, possible just widely across the board and around the world anymore. And the reason for that is that research sites are typically hospitals or research universities, doctor's offices, and clinics. And because of some you know, cross-border travel bans, the stay-at-home orders that were taking place around the world, and then of course the burden on the resources at those sites, patients were no longer able to travel to those research sites. And clinical monitors were no longer able to travel to those research sites. And it became really apparent that the research industry industry was going to need to pivot quickly in order to keep those life-saving therapies um, accessible to those patients. So FDA and other regulators from around the world reviewed and approved changes in clinical trial processes. And some of those changes were pretty big and some of those changes were sim something very simple. And simple things like fitness devices could now be incorporated, like commercial grade fitness devices could be included in clinical trials. The way we executed them by having telehealth and using platforms, televisit platforms, were simple changes that made certain things continue in the clinical research world. And what we also learned is that technology really enables the remote capture of data. And this is really key. So in certain clinical trials, patients were able to actually stay at home and we could have home, home health care visits. It could be a traveling nurse or it could be a, a medical professional that could travel to the home, collect the data, collect the samples. Wearables and home sensors could now be used. So they were putting home sensors on doors and appliances and all kinds of great things to track what was happening in a patient's home and collect that data. Investigative product could be shipped directly to the patient. So instead of traveling to the site to get that investigative product, the product could go to the patient's home. QR codes or quick response codes with API integration could track the investigative product delivery and even the patient compliance. You could have a patient that could scan a QR code and then maybe swallow or administer their investigative product and then the API code would go ahead and send back a date and timestamp that that patient took that medicine. Electronic patient diaries, caregiver and clinician assessments were all being captured differently. They're being captured at home, on a tablet, on a laptop, on, an, on a provision device, or even a bring your own device. But really what makes all of this come together is being able to have that robust integration and interoperability platform that you heard Mifan just talk about a few minutes ago, right? Being able to have the API and the capabilities to integrate this information was very key. In clinical research, we collect a lot of data. We collect not only the patient data itself, their lab values, their um, their personal reported outcomes, their clinician reported outcomes, um, any assessments that we do. But we also capture things about their profile. So we have in there their medical history. We have in there their demographics. 
we keep their um, over-the-counter meds or any other medications that they're taking, all of that data is collected as part of clinical trial research. It all goes into being able to understand the efficacy and the safety of what's being investigated. And on top of that data, there's also operational data. So if we change from having a patient go to a site, and instead we now have someone going to the patient's home, we need to understand that that visit took place. We need to understand the date and time that visit occurred. And we also need to understand what took place during that visit. And all of this is possible if you have a very robust clinical trial platform. So coming out of 2020, and everything that it taught us, we now have something different in front of us. So 75% of clinical trial participants travel at least two hours to a clinical site. And rare disease patients often must either fly across the country or even to other countries in order to participate in a clinical trial. Hybrid or alternative trial designs allow us to look at studies differently. Now, most critical patient needs are still going to have to be addressed at the site, right? So you're not going to have a biopsy at home. You know, you're not going to have you know, some extensive, you're not going to get a CAT scan or an MRI at home. However, what we did learn are there are some of those um, assessments that can happen at home. And so now coming out of COVID, what we are designing are these hybrid studies. So the patient can travel to the site and the data can be collected again, still using an iPad or a tablet, and they can collect the same EPRO data that could be collected at home. So if we have a home health nurse or a trained medical technician travel to a participant's home, and they're able to collect the same vitals, they can do the same assessments, and they can um, minister some investigative product, then we're able to change the way that studies are now conducted because we have the ability to collect the data differently. We have a robust integration platform that allows us to bring data from multiple different devices in multiple different formats. The use of FaceTime and Zoom and WebEx, things that we used for work and home and connecting with our families, were now being used as platforms to conduct televisit and telehealth. So earlier you heard the talk about the consenting and when we use an e-consent or an electronic consent by using a combination between the telehealth platform where they can actually see the patient and the investigator together and they can the patient can read the e-consent, they can acknowledge that they understand it, they can ask the principal investigator any questions about the protocol design or the expectations or the visits that they're going to have take place either on site or in their home. And with the use of these technology platforms, we get a clear understanding that the patient understands and knows how to consent into the study. We capture that data electronically and it's transferred back into Premier Research's entire ePremier ecosystem. What's also changed is that everyday devices are now seen differently. So most of you are familiar with the Apple Watch. It's been in the news. It's been in a lot of articles and, and um, publications about how the Apple Watch was being used. But even just take this Aura Ring, for example. It has gone from personal use to corporate and business use. Many, many sports organizations are using the Aura Ring to collect biometric information around their players. But it also went into research. Now, this example here, obviously, is not clinical research, and there's definitely differences between clinical research and scientific research, right? And there's different regulatory things, but it still is making a, um, an impact. And devices are just being seen differently about how we can collect this electronic data. You know, and it is traveling at velocities far greater than we expected, right? It's happening in near real time. You're getting instant feedback on your biometrics with these type of devices. We're even seeing very, very state-of-the-art technology being looked at for clinical trials. And this is a wireless device that monitors you at home. Now, collecting biomarker data wirelessly, it is seen as convenient. But what about your data privacy concerns? You know, how does artificial intelligence help the patient in need while protecting not only their privacy, but the privacy of others in their same home? 
how you feel about monitoring yourself for your own knowledge, right, might feel different than how you feel about having these types of technologies being used to monitor you in the use of clinical research. Um, you might feel different about that. You, you know, we, we heard mentioned earlier today about being willing to give up your information for a hamburger, right? And are you, are you willing to give up your information for these types of devices to be placed into your home and they're actually monitoring you and they're getting sensitive biomarker information, but it's being transferred somewhere else. It's not going just into your app on your phone and it's being transferred um, by way of APIs and secure APIs is the key here, right? Understanding the balance of patient convenience, being able to collect data remotely and patient data privacy and the level of care for the patient are all the big part of what is changing in clinical research. Let's talk about some of the lasting impacts um, that's happening around clinical research. So at Premier Research, patients are at the heart of every one of our clinical trials. And what had previously been seen as something that would be nice to have, now might be seen as a need to have. 2020 was a major catalyst for the adoption of what we call decentralized research, hybrid clinical trials, adaptive design trials, um, lots of different words finding their way through this process right now. We, we saw a shift away from the traditional brick and mortar, and that shift is still continuing today, right? It's really about how do we design the clinical trial differently, making sure the patient gets all the standard of care that they need, and that clinical research can be a care option is an amazing thing. Being able to make sure that they are safe and get the assessments done where they need to be is really at the core of what is clinical trial research. Um, we're going to see medical devices and wireless sensors play even a larger role than we did before. There's actually a lot of studies out there and research where we're using, you know, um, software as a medical device in some particular studies where they're replacing what would be an investigative product with a software stimulant or a game in the treatment of, you know, ADHD, for example. So we're definitely seeing a big shift in medical devices and wireless sensors. Clinical trial participants being able to join from anywhere, and that's a pretty big word, but you know, to participate being at home or to be able to travel just to your primary care physician and have some assessments provided there, and even local mini sites that we're calling them. Um, CVS announced that they are getting into the clinical research business. They have an entire new business operations inside their big corporation, and they're going to enable their retail pharmacies to become research sites. And this is pretty amazing. I mean, this is the positive that's coming out of COVID in 2020, because one of the things that's been a challenge all along when patients have always had to travel great distances is how do we reach the underserved population, right? But if the clinical trial can go towards the to the patient, if we can bring the safety and the efficacy and the expertise that we have in clinical research to that patient, then we reach a larger population. When we think about the future and clinical research being an option for care, and not just research, then we think about needing to understand all the dynamics and having a larger population, right? Because what is the way that I am gonna to respond to an investigative product is gonna be different than the way my colleague TA might respond to that investigative product, right? But if we can collect the data remotely or even you know, right there near real time and the medical experts can look at the way I'm responding to the treatment versus how the other patients are responding to the treatment, we can fine tune that information such that perhaps one day, even though it's a clinical trial, I can actually get the dosage or the frequency of those medical investigative products at the rate that my body needs it, as opposed to the rate that another participant in the clinical trial needs it. So 2020, you know, has this shadow of being, you know, maybe not the best year 
in, in the history for a long time, but there are very positive things that are coming out. So we talked about the e-consent. We talked about transportation. You can call an Uber if you want. Um, we, can, we can have Uber. We can send Uber. We can pick you up. We can track all that data. We talked about the e-diaries and e-coas and wearables. So what really looked like nice to haves are really now a, a need to have, or at least a need to consider to have in our clinical research trial designs from the trial perspective. So what does that mean for those of us at Premier Research, right? So at Premier Research, we call it our ePremier ecosystem. And it really is a holistic technology that we love that we leverage. And we look at information in clinical trials in three categories, right? So we have all the financial and, um, and administrative type of data, right? So we know what's happening on the study from a financial perspective, right? How much IP have we shipped, right? So we're managing that type of thing, right? We're managing the logistics of the labs, whether it's central labs or local labs. We're looking at study management workflow. This is when did the visit occur? Where did the visit take place? What are the timelines that we're looking at? And then, you know, how quickly are we getting those sites up with their contracts, et cetera? And then, of course, the patient data, which we've talked a lot about, right, which is what can I collect by mobile device? What are we collecting in an EDC? That's called an electronic data capture. I really enjoyed listening to Mifon talk earlier, and he was referring to FER and HL7. And it's really interesting how some of those large EHR companies like Epic um, can we can leverage the WSO2 HL7 compliant and pull data from the electronic health record of the patient into the clinical record of the patient. Remember earlier I said we do collect information about them, their medical history, right, and the medicines that they're taking at this time. And all of that is in the EHR. And when we can use um, HL7 compliant API technology, we can pull it from the EHR into the EDC. And that helps us with a few things, right? A, it gives us security. So we know that the information that's traveling across is the, only the information we need when we need it. It gives us data quality in knowing that we've accessed the right patient's record and that we're pulling the right data across. Today, in traditional clinical trials, what's happening is that data is being entered by the principal investigator or the study team at the site. They're typing it into the EHR. And then eventually, when they get back around to it, key it a second time into the electronic data capture. So we are also see a lag in data entry as well. So at Premier, we take all this information that's collected electronically through all these different systems. We leverage it in through our integration hub. Um, not only do we collect this type of data, but even in COVID and TA will probably share a little bit about this later is, you know, we connected up the Johns Hopkins information. And what was amazing about the Johns Hopkins information was that we could take a look at um, where our clinical research sites were around the, around the world. We could take a look at the hospitalization rates and the infection rates around the world and lay that over a map globally so we could look at the impact of what was happening with COVID, the impact of the hospitalization rates, if that was impacting the sites we had, and what could we do about that? Could we have the patient go to a different site that was maybe nearby um, and still get some treatment because the other one was maybe a higher level hospital that was taking in the COVID patients? So we, we actually use um, our, our information to manage the clinical trials to keep the trial going to the patient. And so leveraging our WSO2 platform capability gives us these very important things, right? Security, integrations, data standards, and data quality. And so to share more about the architecture itself, I'd like to turn it over to TA Nguyen. He is my colleague and the principal architect at Premier Research. Thank you, Larray. To support Larray and all her crazy idea, we at our company call as quote unquote uh, innovation. So we have a lot of data to flow through our uh, systems. And of course, to, in order for us to do that, we will need to have an integration platform. Um, at Premier, we have these five simple um, principles. Everything must be centralized, uh, make it easier to control all the data, especially the configuration of the data. Things like um, um, 
tasks, group of tasks, endpoints, uh, data source connections, or notification, you know, how to turn it on, off, review, approval, um, all of that can be, you know, uh, centralized, stored in the database and uh, properly access and properly control. Uh, that's the key thing. Of course, security and a access. Um, it, you know, uh, we want, you know, ability to control the data, who I'm gonna see what. Uh, not only that, it's certain sensitive data and all that stuff, we also need to encrypt it. Um, not only at, you know, in, in, um, in transit, transit, but it also at rest as well. So um, the other thing is a loose coupling. Um, we want to be able to write code that reusable. So we make a point to saying that source data to the ESB and that's separate from ESB to the destination. The reason is, you know, later on, if we need to add new destination, we can easily do that or we can switch the source or add additional source, we can easily um, done that as well. So reusability is a key thing. Also, you know, a big factor for us to use. Uh, most of our code we wrote, you know, or the ma majority of it will be in uh, Java and 100% usable. Um, we also use standard application interface wherever possible. Um, those are the key thing, key principles that we apply to our integration platform. So um, we selected WSO2 um, because I worked with WSO2 before. I'm very comfortable with the team. Um, uh, we selected the, the Azure platform to uh, deploy our WSO2 platform on top of it um, because simply because our uh, WSO2 managed cloud subscription team is uh, also a pro uh, on the Azure. So make it very easy for us um, to turn over, you know, for help and make it, you know, su uh, sufficient. And a brief history, basically, um, we started in uh, 2017 trying to build um, application, uh, you know, the uh, integration platform. Uh, we start out, uh, surprisingly, it's not with WS2, but um, IBM. Uh, and we went with another consultant firm that is actually supposed to quote unquote the pro uh, with IBM. Um, turn out many different things happened that, you know, it, it didn't work out. Um, in the end, but when I joined in late December 2017, I familiar with WSO2, and so I quickly contact WSO2 team, and we put together a quick POC. And by um, April of 2018, we got the UAT up and running uh, for the our integration, and August of um, 2018, we got the full-blown integration. Um, so our integration pattern start out with a point-to-point -point integration, very typical. Um, and we, you know, quickly realize that that's not sufficient for a lot of data uh, to be going through, and to you know, especially we keep on adding more and more application to our platform, um, it make it very hard. So we went with a star um, integration type um, pattern basically, so on the right. So everything had to go to the hub. And in order for us to do that, we chose the event-driven architectures and um, basically, you know, get all the uh, event data out of different system and pump into the uh, integration hub 
and then from the integration hub go span out to the rest of the destination or applications. So in order for us to do the integrate, you know, the star diagram and all this uh, thing, we have to have an understanding of the uh, business object model behind it to basically build up the um, what are the company data and where they are and how do we capture all this uh, entity, what we call them entity, and how are these entity related to each other and when um, each, each of the event will fire off and how, you know, what type of data it will carry. Um, in order for us to do that, we, we need the help of the business uh, expertise for us to be able to talk, you know, um, IT guy to talk to the business. We need the help of um, some type of simple model. So the model will be using a business object model with the simple notation. With the these notation then um, allow us to communicate with the business um, expert to get the right um, the right standard, uh, the right data model going through, um, so that we can capture all that um the data that we needed so along with all that we you know basically boil down to a simple notation that we can then uh this is the, one of the example for the entire life cycle that we can capture us in the diagram that we can understand how each of these um entity relationship and when it's happened what status go and so on um, so for that, the, will help with the driving out the common data model. So on the common data model, then, you know, uh, everything, all the data pumping from different source, going through the common data model and then return it into destination. Um, so in order for us to do, you know, all these to upper build, uh, upper, um, to communicate with all these different source, um, make it easier to, we come up with the event envelope and that basically we expose a few key things like uh, uh, entity name, uh, event type, the source of the event, event timestamp um, that allow us to communicate without having to know the content of the uh, the message so we can you know then the engine can route using those to route the message to the right locations and so on and our pattern our integration patterns is really simple everything going through the hub need to go through a transformation and that transformation is basically we use an XSLT um, and all that XSLT store in the database as um, with the key it, it determine how to you know anything any a piece of data going through we want it to conform to a common data model and then from the exit of it from our hub go all the way out to the um, destination. We transform it into the destination um, model, data model. So make it easier for us to communicate. Um, and that will basically support our um, star diagram. Of so um, while we waiting for um, back in 2017 while we're waiting for uh, the integration hub to engage you know get all this uh, um, engagement and paperwork to be processed i came up with a literally i wrote a bunch of um, what we call common service all written in java and these are the thing that is actually uh, basic or what we call them a core um, 
services that support you know, the data query uh, service. The key thing about data query service is it's um, predefined queries and they store in database. It gone through tested approval and review and all that stuff. Um, it's also uh, support nested query. It's uh, support any type of database over JDBC. So, um, you know, you, we can just add any type of um, database in, and easily make a, a query out and return the data. The data format can be returned in JSON, CSV, XML, or event model, especially the event model that we use. Um, since it is predefined, um, no injection, no SQL injection will be, you know, uh, should be in place. Um, all query represent by the query ID only, and um, it's no by the query ID only, and it's passing the data, and these data basically you a simple type of data um, for input parameters. So, and on top of it, it's also support the XSLT to transform into whatever the format, the end results needed. Um, the data API basically built on top of the uh, data query service. Um, all it is is really a configuration of a bunch of endpoint map into a query. In, in, in a sense, but it's uh, flexible enough to also um, allow um, custom code. So it doesn't have to be run the query. It could run a Java code, could run a Python, could run pretty much any type of code behind the scene to produce the result that we need. So it, it's, uh, it's built with flexibility in place so that you can you simply map the endpoint to a piece of custom custom code or a query. Um, transformation service, we use XSLT version 2 and, and incorporate the um, encryption and decryption, uh, our own homegrown encryption decryption using AES 128-bit encryption um, to you know, basically, we have a library ourselves that support that, um, and the XSLT, literally that written in Java, so XSLT can call it as a library. Um, and like a, like we you know I say, um, all the queries store in database, all the um, connection store in database, all the endpoints store in database all the tasks and task groups stored in database. Um, same thing with notification, all notification, different notification types uh, stored in database as well. And notification, the way that we designed it, it's based, based on each of the, uh, the event and event type. So if something happened to that event or event type, notification will send to a particular user or group or distribution. Um, the, those are the things that, you know, we, we separate it and make it configurable everywhere. Um, so with COVID, um, we needed to add a lot more data than a simple event data and all that stuff. So we bring in the file data that come in FTP, come from a shared drive somewhere, from data lake, you know, anywhere else, even with the JDBC query. All that, um, so we quickly bring in or introduce another, um, what we call a file integration platform that it allow us to literally download the file from different sources, different location, and consolidate into a global uh, area or, or um, uh, you know, a temporary share location that we, we use uh, with all the security tracking and all that stuff. And then on the other hand, we also have that capability of configure, again, go in and configure when 
do we drop the the file? What type of file do we drop? Where we drop them? And all that stuff, um, you know, it, it's to support a different type of uh, data set. So um, to bring it all together, um, we probably in the near future, we will look into expand a little bit more uh, of configuration, the alert, fine tune even more. Um, right now, we, we added the capability to support the file and file stuff, but we didn't have the alert for the file and file share uh, in place. So that's probably one of the things that we're going to add in the new feature. And then um, the other thing is a major uh, version of migration. We have not talked about this yet, but we are still at version 6.6. .6. We're probably going to have to go to 7 sometime soon. Um, and then, uh, of course, uh, business integrated to a different type of um, clinical application. Those are the highest priority. Um, we wanted to bring in more data. So we constantly add in different adopters for different type of applications that allow us to bring in. So by adapter, I meant, you know, basically an, a location where you can grab, you know, send the data to that is know what to do with it and how to transform that data into our um, common, uh, common data model uh, that we, you know, as a premier research know what to do with it and then how to route the data and where to store. Um, so the other thing is, you know, to also continue uh, evolving into expanding the bomb for clinical data, financial data, uh, and beyond. So, and that's all I have for today.